this was a difficult list to put together. I read a bunch of books this year, some might say too many, and it seems like I always come across another book that I wanted to read, or a book that belonged on this list when I was really looking over everything I read. I started reading more video game novelizations this year, and those get mixed in with the historical and the academic books. The novels ended up being some of my favorite books, so there's a fair number of those on here. There's also, a, I think, one autobiography on this book, but for the most part, they're going to be a lot of historical things or looks back at specific video games. Shadow Keep by Alan Foster Dean was one of the more enjoyable novels that I read this year. It is a paint-by-numbers fantasy story that deviates from the game quite a bit, but it's a really fun story. Oh, and I was wrong about the characters in this. Um, it's supposed to be a kangaroo man instead of a rabbit man. Thank you to everyone that pointed that out for me. I'm still glad that he died in the book, and I was very sad that he was brought back to life because I did not like him at all. The story follows a blacksmith's apprentice as he travels to a keep. There, he has to kill a demon. Along the way, he meets a few companions. And, well, in the keep, the kangaroo man keeps trying to get them all killed. They defeat the demon, and the world is saved. It isn't anything special, but it's a really fun book to read. Shadow Keep has the distinction of being the first video game novelization. Much of the story was invented for the book, as the game is pretty light on the details of what's going on. I still wonder how many people learned about the game from the, from the book, or vice versa. It's one of those things that's kind of interesting if they had any data on that. There is something I find fascinating about novels based on video games, I wonder how closely the author has to follow the game's plot, and how do they account for like multiple playthroughs, telling different parts of the story. It's just a, a really fascinating thing to look at. It can be fun to think about that as you know I read more novels on video games. Fight Magic Items by Aiden Moore got me thinking about a few different things. Uh, specifically, what is the definition of an RPG and how it has changed over the years. I'm unsure if that's what Aiden intended for me to get from this when he wrote this book, uh, but that is where my mind went while I was reading it. Aiden's book follows the evolution of the Japanese RPG, by going through Final Fantasy and the Dragon Quest series. We get the history of these two series, how they've evolved over the years, and what the creators of the games have been up to as really the series has evolved, and just developers leave and go on to other projects or leave the industry entirely. I'm glad that all of this information is in one place, it's a great book to just read and watch the evolution of the RPG genre as, a, as you go through this book, and it sheds some light on some things that I wasn't aware of. It's an easy book to read, and Aiden presents the information really well. If you're into RPGs or you're a fan of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, this is a great book for you. It's a fun and objective look at the two series, and also at the RPG genre itself. David Craddock writes some of the best books on video game history. They're really well detailed, he has an engaging writing style, and these are kind of a personal favorite of mine. Especially his book Rocket Jump, which dealt with id Software. In this book, he tackles the history of Mortal Kombat, Midway, and their relationship with Acclaim. There is a lot of information in this book. David explores the game's, game's development, uh, the growth of the fan base, and the early fighting game community scene in the arcades. There's too much for me to really put into a, an actual summary here, and it's hard to really tell 
what to include in a summary and what not to. This is the first part of the story as it kind of leaves off in the early 2000s. David is one of the authors that I follow to see whatever he's, just to see whatever he's doing and to see if he has a new book coming out. They're always really great books and I learn an awful lot from them. Books like Long Live Mortal Kombat, they give me a lot of ideas for other projects. And it's really cool to read these because they give me a just a ton of information on something, and there's always one smaller story within them that I kind of like to dig down on and find out more about. Long Live Mortal Kombat is an excellent history of the first four games in the Mortal Kombat series. Also, the growth of the fan base, how people would break down the games to really better understand them, and also how they played the games in different markets. I had no idea about like the bootlegged arcade cabinets that were over in Europe at the time, and that was really cool to read about. This is a wonderful book. If you were a fan of Mortal Kombat, definitely check this out. Monster Kids follows the history of Pokemon. It looks at how the games impacted popular culture in the United States during the late 90s and early 2000s. We're briefly following a period of pop culture called Pokemania. It's pretty awesome. I I really love this book. While the book's main focus is on Pokemon and its influence on the handheld video games, anime, and trading card games... We also learn about some of the other properties that came about at this time, specifically looking at the properties that were sort of forced into being Pokemon clones, even if they really weren't. It reminded me of how several like unrelated properties got turned into something wholly different back in the 80s, especially when you look at anime, how it was heavily edited and turned into something else. Stuff like Robotech, which was completely created out of nothing, and Voltron as well. I'm not sure how I forgot about that one. But it was just really cool to see how some things haven't really changed when bringing Japanese media over to the United States. Monster Kids is a fantastic book. It does more than just cover a series of video games. It covers an entire period when video game, when a video game series really just took over pop culture. To the point where it got a little annoying, if I'm being honest. It was the movie, it was in movies, it was TV shows. You had just so much merchandise with Pokemon that really the market became oversaturated with one thing. And then you had a bunch of other properties that came in that sort of got shoved into being Pokemon when they really should not have been. Daniel's book covers all of that beautifully, and it's a wonderful book to read and just discover many things that you can see now how they weren't necessarily meant to compete with Pokemon, but they were sort of forced that way, especially if you're looking at it from a North American perspective. So far, Hell, a Cyberpunk Thriller by Chet Williamson might be my favorite novel based on a video game. The book closely follows the video game's plot, but it changes some things so it won't feel like the main character is doing everything. It also has a very cool setting. In the book, Hell, we follow two characters who work for the cyber police in a dystopian future. The United States in this book has been turned into a theocratic dictatorship, and the government has somehow convinced people that Hell is real. You can even go to hell. There are going to be demons wandering around the streets. And, yeah, all crime and... Oh, gosh, how can I put this? Crime and vice, I guess is the best way way I can put this, is is somehow the responsibility of these demons. But they're allowed to exist, even though everybody seems to know about this. 
the book really sound like when I describe this book, it really sounds like how I imagine Web3 will be in many ways. Just a needless VR that sends you to a vision of hell. You don't need it, but people keep telling you how awesome it is, despite all the evidence against it. This book is excellent. You don't need to have played the game to understand what's happening, and the story is really good. I enjoyed reading this one quite a bit. Minesweeper by Kyle Orland is a great book. I didn't think that you could make an entire book about a game like Minesweeper, and I wasn't sure exactly what to expect when I picked picked this one up. It turned out to be one of the better books from Boss Fight Books. It tells a bunch of smaller stories that surround a very simple game, because you can't just tell the history of Minesweeper until you tell all of these other little stories that all connect to Minesweeper. Kyle explains the game's origins, the minor moral panic that it created, which I thought was hilarious because it seemed to confuse leisure time with work time and people not understanding that you might need a break from your mindless job sitting in front of a computer all day. There are just so many little stories about Minesweeper, and each one of them is incredibly fascinating like going into the speedrunning community and how they were trying to create their own sets of rules that they were all going to play by, how they were trying to determine whether a high score was valid or not. It was really interesting to see. This was a spectacular book. It was one that I wasn't too sure about when I started reading, but as I went on, I found it really hard to put down. And it was kind of upsetting when the book was over and I had to move on to something else. It was more of a history than a personal story, but Kyle's writing is so engaging that it made the book very enjoyable. In Parappa the Rapper, Mike walks the reader through the game and writes about his experiences with it in this book. We learn a lot about the period when the game was released, the inspirations for the game, some more facts about rap music, which I really had no idea about. There's an awful lot in this, and we learn a lot about what this game really means to Mike. Something very important is brought up in this book. Parappa the Rapper is a very short game, and was sold at full price at the time. People sometimes complain nowadays because a $60 game is, you know, 10 to 15 hours long. But back in the 90s, that really didn't matter too much to people, or at least it didn't matter a whole lot to me when I was buying a game. Parappa the Rapper is a 2-3 to hour game at the most, if you haven't played through it before. And... There is more content in it, but it's a very short game if you just want to get through this get through the story. Nowadays this would be like a $10 game, but back in the 90s this was like a $50 game. Even though there were budget titles released around this time, they were a little bit more rare to see. Mike also writes about the themes in this game. Nothing in Parappa the Rapper is really a big deal to anyone outside of Parappa. Nothing really changes for the world around him if he doesn't learn how to drive right away, or if he craps his pants. It'll be embarrassing, but it's not really going to change a whole lot in this world or anything else in the game. It'll just impact him. It's kind of cool to read about stuff like that and read somebody taking that sort of perspective and looking at this game and really going into the story in that way. For a 90s video game, this whole idea of it's not really that important, but it's very important to the main character was something very different, especially at the time when 
you would have a main character in a video game that usually has to go off and defeat someone who's usurped the power of God or some crazy thing like that. The legacy of this game is also brought up where Mike mentions that Parappa the Rapper was a mascot for the PS1 for a brief period of time. He also writes about learning about this game on a demo disc. Both of these kind of made me smile when I was reading this because, one, I learned about other games like Parappa the Rapper that way, but it's the same way I learned about the game. That and seeing the commercials and reading about it in a magazine. And yeah, it was kind of the mascot for the system for a brief period of time. This made me think about how we're drawn to different video games. You know, when I saw Parappa the Rapper, I didn't really think too much of it and passed it by. But when Mike saw it and fell in love with it, it meant something different to him. And it just reminded me that not every game is made for everyone. And, you know, I kind of enjoy learning about why other people like certain games and why they fall in love with them. And it makes me think about the games that I fall in love with or I really enjoyed. This was a book that I was really looking forward to when I found out about it. When John Romero announced it, I immediately pre-ordered a copy. I love learning about the games that I personally grew up with and the ones that I played an awful lot of. And I was hoping for a bit more detail than probably what was going to happen in a book like this. Because I had read other books about id Software, books like Rocket Jump or Masters of Doom or... Um, Scary Dark Fast, I think, is another one. There are a lot of books on Doom out there, and I was kind of hoping that this book was going to shed some light on some of the questions that I had about those books and a few of the inconsistencies in them. The book does deliver on some of that, but I feel like John held back on a few things, or... Well, he held back on a few things, and I guess he omitted some things that weren't necessarily important for the story, but a few other people would have enjoyed reading about. John tells his story, and he had a pretty rough childhood, but eventually found his way to computer programming. It takes a while to get there, but John has a very inspirational story to tell, and it's really interesting to hear about his journey from where he was born, how he grew up, to getting into video games and becoming successful at that. There are some things in here that I didn't know about John's career in video games. I didn't know that he worked at Origin or started his own company before going to Softdisk, and... Uh, he also started making games and sending them out to various companies like different uh, different magazines and that sort of thing. That was something that I didn't know John did, and I didn't know, or at least I don't remember hearing, that that took place in the United States. I knew about that happening over in the UK and in other parts of Europe, but I don't remember reading about it happening here in the U.S., if there is one criticism I have for this book, it would be when he talks about his time at Ion Storm. John talks about some of what happened there, but it seems like he's mostly blaming it on other people, and he doesn't really talk too much about what he did or what he would have done differently, or at least not in the same amount of depth that I would have liked for him to have talked about. This was a really fun book to read. John didn't put as much as I would have liked in here, but he did tell quite a bit about what what he had done before and after its software. It was also really interesting to see how close his story followed the other accounts that I have read. This book was amazing. Caleb is a spectacular writer who does an excellent job of explaining the meaning of just of the game What Remains of Edith Finch. He walks the reader through each level and suggests the possible meanings behind each death of the Finch family. 
In the game, you see the deaths of the different members of the Finch family. This brings the idea of a curse into things. And Caleb explains that the family is cursed, but it is also up to the player to decide whether the curse is real or not. Some of the deaths could be caused because of a curse or something evil inhabiting this house, but others could easily be chalked up to just bad luck. The game doesn't give the player any answers, and Caleb explains that this is intentional. He does that by interviewing the makers of the game and also just kind of walking you through some of the more fantastical deaths and explaining sort of the perspective of the different characters. Reading this book made me want to play the game. Caleb brings up a or Caleb brings a creative approach to talking about video games and I really liked this book an awful lot. Just the way he talks about everything and the way he goes through the game and talks about all of it. This was a book that kind of snuck up on me but ended up being one of my favorite books of the year. several moments in this book just made me smile. It's a series of conversations between Whitney and Brock as they talk about a series of video games that they like. It's just a fun book to read. The chapters follow a pattern. There's a brief conversation about a related topic. Whitney explains the plot of the game, movie or comic book, depending on what they're talking about, and the two discuss what they liked and disliked. And then they go over some of the merchandise that one of them has collected that's related to the game or the movie or whatever. They played through each game before they talked about it, and each chapter is about one of the games in the series, or it's about one of the two movies, or it's about the comic books. It's really cool to read through stuff like this and just get someone else's perspective on the video game or have one person not really understand it and the other one fill in the gaps and explain what's going on, or talk about how the fandom reacted to the game, or just how the critical reviews have changed over time, or even explain why the critical reviews are the way that they are, because sometimes some weirdness happens in the video game reviewing community, whether it's at an actual publication or someone else looking at it. There are definitely themes that get sort of uh, picked up in many different people's reviews that stick around for a while. One of the parts that I liked a lot was when they talked about the first movie's impact on the later parts of the series, especially once once it uh, moved to Western Studios developing these games and how they seem to take more inspiration from the first movie than they did from the previous games. That was really fascinating to really hear it explained that way, because I really would not have thought about that, but it explains an awful lot. These ten were just some of the books that I read this year, but I felt like they were the best out of all the ones that I did. There were others that I had planned on reading, but just ran out of time, and I'll try to get to next year. The only books that I wouldn't say that I liked would be the Doom books, because that series just went downhill fast after the second book, and they became just absolutely nonsensical once the authors had to create their own story and seemingly forgot all the rules that they had established in the previous books. This uh, this was the only time that I really didn't like some of the books that I wanted to read. Like, I picked up something because I thought it started off really well, and then as I kept reading more of the series, I was like, wow, this is, this is shit, and the author should feel bad for it. <laughs> My favorite book this year was Suddenly I Was a Shark by Caleb Ross, and Minesweeper by Kyle Orlin was probably a close second to that one. I find these two books to be really interesting and also kind of inspiring in some ways. I got ideas from other projects and for things that I wanted to write about and talk about and make videos on. They're both really great books. 
I'm looking forward to seeing what books come out in 2024. And I have a bunch of novels that I want to get to because I there's just so many of them and they seem to be pretty fun to read through as well as going through some of the books that kind of snuck up on me last year that I've picked up now, but I didn't pick up when they were first released. Anyway, uh, that's going to wrap things up. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will talk to you all later. Bye, everyone.